Heavenly Father, what an honor it is to stand before you. Lord, knowing that you gave everything for us, Lord, that we might be able to give something back to you, to glorify your name, to worship you from our hearts, with all of our soul. Lord, that we would make a stand for what you've done, that people would know your joy, your truth. Lord, the unending love that you provide in our lives, that you created. Lord, we acknowledge that this morning. You are above all things, Lord, you made all things through your Son. You set all things into motion. Lord, who are we to have such a relationship with the creator of the universe? Help us to have reverence for who you are, to know that you are holy, to know that you have the best for those who pursue and love you. Lord, let us never take these things for granted. Lord, that we get to freely worship you in a public place. Lord, help others to see what this is all about, what this relationship is all about. Lord, that you laid everything down, you gave your only son, just so you could have a relationship with us, that we would just turn to you, trust in you, believe in you, and everything you've done, everything you've said. Lord, help us as a church to continue to make this stand as we enter a new season. Lord, let's, let these relationships grow deeper. Let our relationship with you grow deeper and our knowledge and understanding of the Holy Spirit, the one that is with us right now, in this place. Lord, we pray for the message this morning, that you would give us ears to hear and a soft heart, that our eyes would be open to your truth and everything you've done. Lord, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church the park. Are you on? Is your pack on? My name is uh, John Avery, and I am the pastor at Living Water Community Church, and uh, glad you came to join us this morning. This is the last one we're doing of the summer. Uh, we do these um, four times in the summer. The last one we did in August, we couldn't actually be out here, so we're thankful that the weather kind of uh, switched on us, and we're able to uh, have a service out here. So um, who we are as a church, if you are new, first I'd like to say welcome. If you are new, then, uh, on, at the welcome tent over there uh there is a connect card we'd ask you to fill that out drop in the offering box that's over there as well uh it allows us to just connect with you <laughs> and get to know you a little more and if you have any questions with the church or anything else we can answer those questions uh for you um so what we are here to do today is obviously we have our church service out, out in the park um we love doing this and the main message we want to get across today is who jesus is and his love for you. And but before that, a couple quick things. Kids are dismissed. We do have a kids program. If you have kids here, um, I always forget things. So um, go with Langton right there. He's in the blue shirt, sunglasses. So if you have kids and they want to go have a fun kids program, they're a great program over there. They, they can go uh, with him. And also one other quick thing that I, I don't want to forget to announce. Um, next Sunday night, 
We are having our first South End uh, night service. It's at the VFW at 5 p.m. Uh, inside your bulletin, you probably got a little card that tells you when it is. So it's starting September 8th. It's gonna happen every single week um, at the VFW. It's about an hour long service. Right after the service, there will be a meal, um, free meal for anybody that wants to come. So obviously everyone is invited. Love to see you there. Um, and especially if you have any, um, if today, you, any interest in, in the gospel, any interest in Jesus is starting to work in, if God's starting to work in your life, I would encourage you to for sure uh, come check us out uh, next week. And also, uh, we do meet Sunday morning, 1030. Uh, we have a bus. Uh, so if you do need a ride, the bus number, I believe it's at the welcome table as well. Love to pick you up. Um, and for you to join us next Sunday at our actual actual building. We do have a building. So this is rolling, so. Um, over by Kobe College. So anyways, so what we're, do, what we're here to do today is obviously we're here for a purpose. We're here to proclaim that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the King of kings, Lord of lords, that king, the, your creator, he desires a relationship with you. And today um, could be the day, and we've been praying about this, our church has been praying about this, that this could be the day that your life changes forever. And we hope and pray that God um, interviews, intervenes in your life and today you become a follower of him. But my words mean nothing. <laughs> my words have no weight behind them um, if, if they're not grounded in God's word. The word of God is alive. It is active. It can cut to the deepest part of your heart. It's, it's, it, the, the word shapes and molds us. The word is what is, is, is what is going to change our lives. So with that, let's open our Bibles. We're going to be in God's word today. We're going to be in the book of Acts. Um, this entire summer, we've been going through the book of Acts as, as a church body. Um, and quickly, Acts, what Acts is, is the account or the acts of the apostles of Jesus. So Jesus' disciples, um, they, they went out and they literally changed the entire world as we know it. And this book, the book of Acts, tells us the account of how that happened. So if you just kind of follow what happened, Jesus died on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Then he ascended into heaven, and then Book of Acts basically takes the story forward of what happens after. Right after Jesus ascended in heaven, what happens? What did, what did what his disciples do? What do his followers do? And this book tells us this. And one of the followers of Jesus that we've been reading about inside the Book of Acts is the a man by the name of Paul. And we've been following Paul's missionary journey, first missionary journey, now in his second missionary journey, and he has led to the land of Greece. And today we're going to read something I, I have been excited to preach over, because it's, it's such a perfect text for this setting and where we are today, and it's it's and I, I, it applies to my life, and I believe it's going to apply to m many of your lives here today. So, you have a Bible, turn to Acts 17. If you don't have a Bible, there is over the welcome tent over there. There's, there's a whole bunch of Bibles. If you don't have a Bible at all, take that Bible home with you. It's our gift to you. Um, we love giving away Bibles. We have a bunch over there. So it would be great if we go home with none. So take a Bible if you need one. All right. So before we dive into God's Word, Acts 17, let's, let's pray real quick. Father God, I pray that the Word would come alive today. I pray the Holy Spirit is in our midst. I pray the Holy Spirit does a work that I cannot do, and that is to speak to our hearts. That the Holy Spirit would, would challenge, convict, encourage. The Holy Spirit would, would take the, the, any hearts of stone or any, 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 any barriers that are, that are in the way of, of you, that you would break down those barriers right now in people's lives. You would break chains. You would, you would set the captives free, Lord. And I pray that right now there would be a life, even if it's one person, but I pray that there's many, Lord, that are, that are in our midst right now, that their lives would be changed forever um, by you. We've been praying for this all week, Lord, the Holy Spirit goes before us, and the Holy Spirit prepares the way. So I pray right now, Lord, as the, the word is going out, that the word, as we know, will not return void, and I pray that it will change someone's life today. Be with my words, help me to speak what you want me to say. We love you. In Jesus' name I say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Acts 17, we're going to begin in verse 16. It says this. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, as he saw the city was full of idols. So we pick up Paul's journey in the city of Athens. Now, I want to 
hit on this. I think it's, this just sets the stage of what we're going to read about for the rest of, of this, this passage today. The, the, the city of Athens, Paul describes it as a city full of idols, idols everywhere, which historically is very true. Some of the most famous ancient buildings that you know of found their, find their home in the city of Athens. The buildings like the Parthenon and, and, and numerous temples d dedicated to Zeus, Athena, Herodotus. Um, all of these temples and structures, some even still erected today. If you kind of can picture probably some of your history books, those big uh, buildings with those big columns, right? Those, those buildings are found in the city of Athens. And most of these buildings very impressive structures. They're pieces of art, but most of them, if not all of them, were all dedicated to the worship of a Greek god. And so, so you can think about when Paul walks into the city, he's used to Jerusalem with their synagogues and mostly Jews. Of course, he's seen idol worship, but never like this. City full of idols. There is, there's temples everywhere in every street erected to, to worship of Greek gods. He's watching people sacrifice, to giving things up to these big stone and, and wooden statues. And, and, and he says, this city is full of idols. Now, what does Paul do in Athens? Though? So he walks in the city, sees it full of idols. And, 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 and it's interesting, we walk into our city, right? There, uh, we have a city full of idols. It's just different, though. We don't see them erected, they're, but, they're, but they're all around us, right? Through, through our possessions, through our cars, through our finances, through just, just things that you make. An idol is anything you put before God. And any, anything that you value more than you do God, that is an idol inside your life. And, and we all have them, and we have a country and a world that is full of them right now. So what does Paul do? Think about this. He walks in Athens, see idols everywhere. He sees people lost, see people engaging in idol worship, which is literally worshiping stone figures. So what does he do? The same thing he does in every other city. Look at verse 17. So he reasoned in a synagogue with the Jews and devout persons in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So what's Paul do? He preaches. And Paul's a preacher. Every, every, every town he would go in, he would preach, and he does something very similar. First, he finds a synagogue. So he preaches to the Jews, but then he goes out, he goes into the marketplace where he's speaking to a mostly pagan Greek audience. And he tells us he did this every single day. He go back out in the marketplace, go in the public square and he preach. And understand this is why we do what we do right here. This is why we, we are out in the public, is why we are preaching right on the public, because we believe it's vital for every Christian to be in the public and preach the greatest news ever. Amen. We believe that this, this news of Christ is too important, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, 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 it's the most important message in all the world, and this message cannot be hidden under a rock or in buildings. His name and his message must be shouted on rooftops and for us through speakers, right? Going out and hopefully people can hear it as far as, as, as our speakers will go. Now you ask, though, what does Paul preach? So he's in the public square. What is he talking about? What is he going to preach about? Look at verse 18. We'll continue on. Some of the Eupicurean and Stoic philosophers also converse with him. And I want to pause it because pause there, this... This is hinting at what, what is going on. And, and it, as you break this down, I believe that some of you here, this, what, what is happening is exactly what's happening right now inside of, inside of your heart. So he, he, Paul catches the attention of the philosophers. Athens was a city full of idols, but Athens also was known to produce some of the greatest minds our, our world has ever seen. Minds that have shaped Western culture, minds that have shaped politics. Even today, there's some of the philosophers that lived in Athens that, that literally we still uh, follow some of their stuff. People, philosophers like Plato, you've probably heard of these names before, so Socrates, Aristotle, all were from the city of Athens. But even though these philosophers and ideas and their reasoning had impact on the world, their philosophies and their worldview would always come up empty. They always were missing one vital piece. That their gods, that the gods that they worship can never answer for them. So you see what's happening is these philosophers at that time, they hear Paul speak about something and saying, there's something different about this message I've never heard it before. Now something important about the philosophers. What the philosophers were seeking at this time was a virtuous life. 
Basically, what a virtuous life is, is, it, is they were seeking a good life, a moral life, that, that would bring about human prosperity. They wanted the world to be a better place. And so they had two schools of thought that are mentioned here, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, both of these schools of thoughts are still alive today, and I would even say some of you here, probably without even knowing, you're falling into one of these two categories. The, the, the Epicurean, the, you, you, I have a hard time saying this word. The, the Epicurean is, they seek pleasure and happiness. To have fun with others. The, the, the saying, eat, drink, and be merry. The attitude, live it up. Live your best life now. Life is a party. This was the Epicureans. The, and they believed that if they sought to indulge in the things of this world, that they would find pleasure, they would find satisfaction in this life, and they would be more happy. And in thus being more happy, the world would be a better place, right? If you could just have everything you want, you could just indulge in all your greatest fantasies, you have everything you want, then you'd be more happy, and of course, life would be better, right? And then you have the Stoics, literally the total opposites. They believe in self-discipline and charity. They believe that, that, that through strict discipline, working hard, working to earn as much as you can, to make a good living, that, that, and even deprive, your thing, deprive yourself of things that are fun, to stay dip with discipline, you would achieve more in this life. And in order to be, a, to be a good citizen, you need to achieve more to be disciplined, and then you can give back to your community, and thus make the world a better place, right? Both of them wanted to make the world a better place, they had two totally different ideas. And I ask you today, do you fall into one of these schools of thought? Do you think life is one just, it's just one big party? You always want to have a smile on your face. You want to bring happiness to others. Or are you the opposite, where you, where, where you think life is about work, success, but then you also want to give back to others? Each of these schools of thought, the interesting part is they have some truth in them. If they're missing something, and Paul's message of Jesus is a new teaching, they never heard this before. They never heard the name of Jesus before. But when Paul gave this message, they said, this is a different way to have a virtuous life. And when they started to hear Paul preach, they realized this virtuous life that Paul speaks about is actually attainable. And it's more realistic. You can't continue on. Let's read verse 18 and continue on verse, up to verse 21. It says this. I'll read it again. Some of the Eupicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said... What does this babbler wish to say? And others say he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he's preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the to the. Uh, I can't the same words. Areopagus, uh, 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 Areopagus, there we go. Areopagus, saying, "May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean." Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So what Paul's doing, he offered a new teaching. And the first time they hear this, some would say, it's a babbler, crazy man preaching. Some of you might think I'm a babbler right now, just preaching nonsense, right? But as they listened more, they noticed something. They noticed Paul was a very educated man. He was smart. His message was very clear, and his message started to make sense. So he started listening to his message, and he started saying, he's preaching about this Jesus, this perfect man. This man that literally was the definition of a virtuous man. He lived a virtuous life to a T. None of us can live a virtuous life, but Jesus did. But then this Jesus, Paul keeps preaching, he died on a cross. And he died for the sin of the world all to forgive us, and all so that we could live a virtuous life through Jesus. And the most incredible thing about the, Paul's claim about Jesus is that three days later, this Jesus would rise from the dead. And this Jesus is alive today. And so they, and they hear and they say, he's preaching about a foreign God, a God that we've never heard about before, a God that has done something that our gods cannot do. Come to literally earth, live a perfect life, die on the cross, do nothing wrong, and then raise himself from the dead, and then ascend him into heaven. They start to hear this claim about this Jesus and said, if this is true, he far is far more superior than any of the Greek gods. He's more superior than any god. Now understand, some of the Athenians, they, they, 
I, now understand something about, something about the Athenians. Something I want to bring to light today. They're not much different than the audience that I preach to right now. My guess is all of you here today, you probably are, are, are seeking something else in life. You're seeking something, a, a better life. You want a good life. I don't think anybody would say, I want a bad life. I don't want to live a virtuous life. But what, one major difference about the Athenians and us here today is probably every one of you here has heard about Jesus before, right? My guess is that all of you here today, you probably have heard the gospel. You've, you've heard in pieces that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead three days later and ascended into heaven. You know this truth, yet some of you here today have not made him the king of your life. Now think about this. Arguably the greatest minds of that time, the philosophers of Athens, students of the great Socrates and Plato, they were seeking to know who this Jesus guy was. And those philosophers, they bring him to, the, to this big arena, set on a hill, where the greatest minds of that time would debate with each other to learn and to seek out this new teaching. So let me ask you another question. I want to get your mind thinking here. Even if you've heard this message a hundred times, I want to ask you a question, that, and I, I'm praying that you would answer yes to this. Are you seeking and open to Jesus? Are you open to hearing this? I know there's some here today that literally blocked this message out of your mind. You said, no way, I never want to follow Jesus, and, and you, you're, you're done with this. You said, and you know, some of you right now, you, I'm, I'm preaching, you say, I've heard this before. I've heard this all, all the time. I know this guy's going to say, I grew up in church, whatever it might be. And it's you that's in great danger right now if you're shutting off this message from, from entering into your life. If this is you, man, I encourage you right now to be open. And for this moment, put aside all your prejudices towards Christians. Put aside what, what the Christian did to you at some point in your life. And I would ask you right now to be humble. Put down your pride. Put down the sin that you're, late, you're, you're clinging on to. And hear this message for the first time ever in your life like the Athenians did 2,000 years ago. A message that, about God that can radically change your life. If you allow this message to sink in. So let's hear what Paul has to say. And he gives one of, the most, one of my most famous, or one of my favorite sermons found in all the book of Acts. Verse 22, it says this. So Paul is standing in the midst of the Orochopus saying, Men of Athens, I perceive that you, that in every way, you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects you worship. I found also an altar with an inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being the, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, anything since he himself gives life to all mankind and breath and everything in it. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps find, feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your poets have said, for we indeed, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art or imagination of man. The time of ignorance is God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man who he, who he has appointed. And this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. I love this passage. Paul is standing up in front of hundreds of people, highly educated men and women, probably wealthy men and women, men of influence, men of power, people that have never heard before this teaching, never heard this worldview. And he starts by saying this to them, I can see you are religious. 
Listen to me right now. I want you to understand this. I stand right here right now, and I believe I can say this without a shadow of doubt. That I'm standing in front of people right now that you are religious in every way. And why do I say this? First, some of you I know are Christians, okay? But even some of you here, when Paul says, I see religious, what he means is, I, you have a belief in God. And amongst this crowd right now, I do believe 90 or not 100% of us have some sort of belief in God. Whether that means you believe in Him or maybe you don't believe in Him. But I'm going to make a guess that most of us here, if not all of us here, believe in God in some way. And you're just like the people of Athens. The thing, the thing is, though, you're like the people of Athens. You have this God that is unknown to you. And why am I so confident in saying this? Because I believe every person in the world, if they are intellectually honest with themselves, they believe that there is a God. Whether you call this God God, or you call this God something else, or, or you call this God in higher power, I believe you believe in a God. Romans 1 says that God's attributes, His divine nature, is seen in creation. Every person, says so the Romans 1, has no excuse not to believe in Him. The psalmist says that the fool says in his heart there is no God. Statistics say, show us that there's very few atheists in this world. And I'm also making an assumption that, that most would probably not show up to a church at the park. Now I believe that the, the audience I speak to right now is not much different than the audience that Paul speaks to. And that almost every single one of you here today, you believe in some type of a God. So what Paul's goal in this passage is to make the God of the Bible, the, the, the unknown God, known to them. And he does it by giving them four truths I want to go through. For us to understand of who is this true God. And I'm hoping that the first time this clicks, and you say, yes, that's the God I want to follow. The true and living God. The first thing Paul says is God is the creator and the giver of life. The true God does not dwell in a temple. He doesn't dwell in a building made by men. He's not made of material like gold or silver or stone. And he's not formed from our imagination. I think the God, a lot of the gods you serve is formed out of your own imagination. That's the, that's the day we live in right now. Most of us aren't carving statues of our God, but we make him up in our own mind. That's not the God of the Bible. He's not created by us. He doesn't need anything from us. He is God. Whether you want to accept him as God or not, he is God. Instead, the true God is the creator of all things. He is not creator. He is not created. He is the creator of all things. He is outside of time. He is outside of matter. He is outside of space. This God is unlike you and I. And of all things that God created, He created all things. Created by Him and for Him. There is nothing in this world that God did not create. And this God is the giver of life. The reason why you have breath in your lungs today is not because of random chance. No, it's because the God of the universe cares and loves you. And the second truth about God we find in the text is, is Paul literally says that this God is not far from us. The true God is not a distant God. The true God is not a God that's just out there looking down on us and is not a part of our life. The, the true and living God is here with us right now. This true God loves us intimately. When he, and you see this in creation. When God, when God created man, he, didn't, he created man in his image, and he created him special, different, set apart from all of the creation. God did not speak man into existence like he did the animals, let there be cow or, or lion, no. What God did is he molded man into the, into the dirt, and then he literally breathed life into man. The true God loves his creation, he loves the world and he loves you. So much so that he would that, that once sin, ter, sin entered into the world, not because of anything God did, but because of man's disobedience, God made a rescue plan to bring us back to himself. The true God never abandons those that he loves. He could have, we sinned, we rebelled against him. He could have easily said, I'm done with you. But he did not do that. He made a plan to come back to this, this world. The true and living God will always seek us out. And he's, I believe he's seeking you out right now. Like a father would his lost child. And all of us are lost. 
Some of you, well, all of us once were lost, and some of you still are lost right now. You're seeking and searching to find this good life, this virtuous life, just like the philosophers that Paul was speaking to. But just like every person throughout all human history, you're only going to find it in one place. You're only going to find it in a father that loves you. Because I believe every person is seeking a father to care for you, to provide for you, to protect you, to give you a rest from this crazy world. And to give you satisfaction in this life that you've been searching for your entire life, but you never found it. The true God is a father that is seeking to adopt you as his own. And the true God is not far from us. And I believe he's speaking to some of you right now. But here's the reality. Jesus says the true God is speaking to some of you right now. There's also a false God. The God of this world. He's not the true God. He's a fake God. And, 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 he's, and, and this false God is the one that the Athenians worshipped. And you might not even realize it, but it's the one that you worship as well. And the one that you are following right now. Right now, he's speaking into your mind. He's filling your mind full of lies. He's telling you, do not follow God because he seeks your own destruction. He seeks to destroy you. He seeks to ruin your life and to steal all joy and peace and happiness out of your life. And I want you to think about this. If you're not one of God's children, then whose child are you? If you're not following God, then who are following you? The, the, the Bible says that there's only two masters in this, this world. Two masters. If you follow the Lord, you're going to follow the enemy. Who we call Satan. Who is your father? And listen to what Paul says. The time of ignorance is over. The time of acting like this is not real is over for you. Because now the true God, this is faced before you. Like I said, are you willing to be open and are you willing to seek him right now? Because now is the time that the true God is fa you're face to face with him. Now it's time for you to repent. He's speaking to you right now. And who are you repenting to? The third truth about God is that God is a judge. Only the creator of the world can judge the world. Only the one who's all-powerful, all-knowing, who's not bound by, by, by time, can truly judge all things because he knows all things. And the true God will judge the world in one thing it says in Scripture, righteousness. What does this mean? He will judge you according to your deeds, your actions, how you obey God and how you obey his commands, how you love your neighbor as yourself. And how are you doing with that? If you're honest with yourself... This ought to cause great fear. Because if you're honest with yourself, you know you're not righteous. None of us are. I'm not righteous. You're not righteous. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No person is righteous. No, not but one. The Athenians and philosophers, they knew this. This is why they debated over and over and over again how to live the virtuous life. Because pleasure and happiness does not lead to a better life. Instead, it leads to overindulgence and addiction. And the Stoics knew if they could have all the self-discipline, they could make all the right decisions, they, they could they try to make all the right decisions in this life, but they always would find a way, they find a time that they, they, they get distracted. They fall short of the plan they made. And what happens? Shame. They didn't live up to what they wanted. They didn't live up to their parents. They didn't, they didn't live up to, to what society told them they need to do. And then shame fills them, and then they, they think, I'm not good enough. And they start to think, I'm not good enough for God. This is why Paul's message of Jesus drew the philosophers in. Because the first time there was an answer how to live a virtuous life, for the first time ever, they, they finally heard a message to say, this is how I can be right before God, God the judge. This is how you can live a better life, and this is how you can be righteous. And the answer, understand, is not found in yourself. It's not found in you. But instead it's found in God who made this earth. And he made this earth knowing that we would sin. And he made this earth knowing that he would have to send his son, Jesus, to die for us. So what's the answer? How to have a, how to have a virtuous life? It's not a what, but it's a who. Jesus. And the fourth truth Paul ends with is the true God was made known through Jesus Christ. Jesus made known to us the true and living God. 
And how can we be certain of this? By Jesus raising from the dead. So follow me. The way to live a virtuous life, the way to live a good life, the, that, that will bring prosperity to yourself and to others. The, wor- the way this world is going to literally change. We all see the chaos around us. We all see what's happening. You know how, how the world's going to become a better place? It's through Christ. The only way that you can be made righteous and be right before God, the only way you can know the true living God, the only way you can have peace and joy in your life is only found in Jesus and Him alone. Why? Because Jesus and only Jesus has conquered our greatest enemy, the one that would defeat every single one of us, which is death. And when He conquered death, He also conquered the consequence or or, or the reason why we all die, which is sin. The greatest stealer of joy and peace in our life is sin and death, and Jesus Christ conquered both of them. So let me ask you this. When I say this right now, what is your response? What comes to mind? Because understand something. This message of Jesus, it requires a response. And you all have probably already responded in your heart in some way, and I've been praying that, 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 that in this moment, you will respond rightly. But the same thing happened, I want to close up this text today, when Paul preaches this message. There's three responses, and I believe there's probably three responses here today as well. And I want to encourage you to have the right response. I want to finish it out. Verse 32, it says this in Acts 17. Now when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from the midst, but some men joined them and believed. Among them also were Dionysus, the Aragapite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. There's three responses here. And I believe we all fit in one of these three responses. And I want to end with this, because there's three responses to the gospel, and, and, and I'm hoping and praying that through this, you will have the right response. The first is this, is mockery. You once again have denied the God of the Bible, the one that loves you, the one that seeks you out. You once again have heard this message, you probably have heard, and you said, I want nothing to do with it. And for this, uh, I'm going to say this, I'm going to pray for you. I hope at some point in your life, you will finally understand the God of the universe that loves you. You'll stop running from him and you'll run to him. You'll understand what it says in Galatians. Galatians 6, 7-8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap in return. The one who sows to please his flesh, to please the world, to please your own self, your selfish desires, from the flesh you will reap destruction. But from the one who sows to please the Spirit, to please God, that will turn to him. From the Spirit you will reap eternal life with Christ. God is not mocked. Do not mock him right now and do not run from him. The second is this. The second response is you're interested. You want to know more. You are open. You're seeking. You recognize at this point in your life that you, you, the thing, everything you've been trying, it's it's not working. You tried all these other things. You tried to, to search out this, try to do this, just like the Stoics and the Eupicureans, like philosophers. You're trying all the different things, but they're always coming up empty. You know, you know, there's a God in this world, and you want to grow in understanding who this true and living God is. If this is you, you ask, what should I do? First thing is this. Talk to someone right after the service in one of these blue shirts. Talk to them. Ask questions. You can ask any question you want. There's no stupid question. Trust me. I've asked them all. Right? Ask questions. Second thing is this. If you're interested, come to church next Sunday. Whether this be our building, 169 Rice Rips Road. If you need a ride, you got a bus. Or this is at Living Water South End at the VFW at 5 p.m. Come to church next Sunday. Or even, I'd even say this, is there's plenty of other good churches around. And, and we are a kingdom. We are all together in this. Find a different church if you're in, in our area. But go to church next Sunday and start your relationship with God. Seek Him. And the third thing, and I'm hoping this is, this is many of us today, or some of you today. Third thing is this, you surrender. You surrender. As it says in this text, some believed. What it means when it says some believed is some made Jesus their king and their Lord right at that moment. Are you ready right now to surrender your life to King Jesus? 
Are you ready to stop running from the true living God? Are you ready to start running to him and start a new life with the God that loves you? If this is you, pray. Once again, come seek out somebody in a blue shirt. Come talk to me right after the service. Same thing. Go to church next Sunday. Start your relationship with him. But if you are ready to surrender your life to the Lord today, do not walk out of this place without talking to somebody. Tell somebody about this. Tell somebody about this relationship you make to hold you accountable in this. Because the enemy, the minute you surrender, he's going to try to swipe you away. He's going to take you away. He does not want you to follow Jesus. He is the he is, he is the, the he wants to seek and destroy your life. But as scripture tells us, Jesus says that Jesus came to give you life and life abundantly. This life is found in Jesus. Seek him today. So end with this. What is your response today? With that question, I want to just pray over us. Father God, as I said at the beginning, my, my words are empty without you. I can do nothing apart from you. The power of this message is in the Holy Spirit. And Lord, what I have prayed, the Holy Spirit has, has, has been working in somebody's life today, Lord. That the Holy Spirit has been, has been just turning inside of them. The Holy Spirit has been drawing them in, and, and, and doing something in them that they might not even realize what's going on. But, you're, but what's happening is you're drawing them to themselves, to, to yourself right now. I pray for that person that's ready to surrender right now, that, that in this moment they will pray to you, they will seek you out with no special words, just, just in their heart, they ask you to be the Lord and the King of their life. That they believe in the heart that you died for them and you believe that you rose from the dead. And in this moment they're surrendering their life over to you. Change them, mold them, help them to understand who you are. And for those, Lord, that are, that are interested, those that are just saying that this is something to this message, there's something about this, Jesus. I pray that, that, that the enemy would not take them away, that the, the seeds are being planted right now, they would not be, be carried off and, or, or be squandered, Lord, but right now, the seed that's being planted in them would grow. They find a church, whether it be our church or another church that believes in, in, in the Bible and that teaches the Bible. I pray they start this new life with you. And for those that are mocking you right now, I just pray, Lord, I pray for their, for, for their goodness. I pray that they, they will find you. I pray that they would not be, that they would not go through this life, keep the, keep the continuing to mocking you, that at some point in this life, God, you would, you would grab a hold of them in whatever way you have to, Lord. You'd break down this barrier that they have put up inside of their life and they'd finally understand that, that, that you are the God of the universe, you're the true and living God, and that you love them deeply. And Lord, as we're out in public, I just want to pray over the city of Waterville, Lord. I pray that the city of Waterville, that the, all these barriers that are up, Lord, there's many, Lord, thousands that do not know you, but you seek and desire a relationship with them. I pray for revival over our city. I pray that many would come to know you, Lord, and this water will be transformed by you. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and worship one more time together.
God bless. Thank you all so much for joining us. Do join us next week, like John said, for either a church in our building back in the Rice Rips Road or down here at the VFW. We look forward to seeing you. Stick around. We have some great food for everybody. And have a great day. God bless.